Coming up in this episode. Welcome back to Retro Bits. I'm still Matt D'Amico, and it's still Marchintosh. And that means another opportunity to mess around with classic Mac stuff. In the previous episode, we looked at shapeshifter emulation on the Amiga. Today, we'll see what we can do with modern hardware, namely the Mr. and Raspberry Pi 400. Now, I've covered both of these systems in past bits, so I'll include links to those episodes in the description, in case you missed them and want to catch up. If you recall back in episode 22, we discussed how the MISTER uses an FPGA to emulate the original hardware of classic systems. While such emulation can theoretically be perfect, right down to cycle accuracy, that's not always the case. Keeping that in mind, let's take a look at the Macintosh Plus Core. Presently, this is the only Macintosh Core available for the MISTER. It emulates an 8 MHz 68K Mac Plus with up to 4 MB of RAM, two floppies, and a 20 MB hard disk. And that's about it. Reading further down, we can see that this core is still an early work in progress and that the SCSI interface is only partially implemented. Well, let's give it a try anyway. Maybe we'll be surprised. I've already got an empty 20 meg hard drive image from the project's GitHub page loaded up, and a set of Mac OS 6 floppy images to install from. Even if it is minimal, it's nice to have a proper menu-driven user interface that lets us mount and unmount disk images while the emulator's running, something I missed with Shapeshifter on the Amiga. So far so good, everything seems to be working fine. Keyboard input is a little fiddly though. Unless you type each key slowly and methodically, it tends to get stuck in uppercase or repeating characters half a dozen times for no reason. Let's get this disk initialized so we can install macOS on it, because booting from floppy disks is really slow. Well, there weren't any errors during the installation. It looks like the system folder is present, so all that's left to do is restart the emulator and see if it boots from the hard disk. Here's where things took a turn for the worse. The system booted up from the hard disk image okay, and after gingerly inputting a name for the computer, it rewarded me with a gray screen and never got past that point. I tried reinstalling a dozen more times with different permutations of ROM and OS versions, hard drive image size, and RAM settings, but to no avail. It would either lock up on the gray screen or enter an endless reboot loop. I guess this is what they meant by partially implemented. Despite striking out with the hard drive, I still wanted to see what this core was capable of. It seems to have no problem running period correct software from disk images, albeit slowly. Unlike Shapeshifter on the Amiga, there were no unexpected crashes in this game, so that's a bonus.
The Plus was a pretty early machine in the classic Macintosh lineup, having been released in 1986. Just like the machine itself, the Mr. Core has few bells and whistles. As this project is still under development, it may be worth checking back later on to see how it's progressed, but for now I can't really recommend using it unless you want to run some vintage monochrome software from a floppy image. The Mister is capable of some truly remarkable things. This is not one of them. A better option would be to install Shapeshifter on the Minimig Amiga core and use its built-in Picasso 96 retargetable graphics and O20 CPU to emulate a much more powerful classic Mac with color and lots of features. Setting that aside for the moment, let's turn our attention to this. In the previous episode, I mentioned Basilisk 2 as the successor to Shapeshifter on the Amiga. Well, it's back with a native build for the Raspberry Pi's ARM CPU, available as a convenient binary package for RetroPie. Basilisk emulates a Mac Classic or Mac 2 series and can run Mac OS up to 8.1 with color, sound, native disk partitions or hard files, networking, and more. The RetroPie documentation for the Macintosh emulator is, shall we say, Spartan. It tells you where to place your ROM and disk images, but that's about it. No mention is made of which ROMs are supported, how to set up a hard disk, mount multiple disk images, configure the machine's RAM, CPU, or how to use the emulator. Fortunately, Basilisk's GitHub page has an old README file that spells out all of the available configuration options we can use. There's no mention of the ARM build, but under the hood, RetroPie is just Linux, so apart from a few different file locations, most of the Unix settings in the document are applicable. In order to set this up properly, we're going to need to get our hands dirty, so let's get right to it. In episode 26, I reviewed this Raspberry Pi 400 and installed RetroPie on it along with the Amiberry Amiga emulator. Since I've already covered how to install and configure RetroPie itself, I'm just going to add Basilisk to the existing installation. Since we last looked at the Pi 400, I've installed a number of additional emulators, including the Dreamcast, as well as Daphne, which plays Dragon's Lair and other Laserdisc games. To install the Basilisk 2 emulator, we need to fire up the RetroPie setup tool. In the Manage Packages menu, we'll find it under Optional Packages. Simply install from the pre-compiled binary, provided your Pi has network connectivity, and that's that. Once installation is complete, exit out of the configuration tool and restart emulation station. Macintosh will now show up as an option, but without a ROM or disk image to use, it won't actually do anything when you try to start it. Let's take a look at the ingredients we'll need to make our dreams of apple pie a reality. First, we'll need a ROM, and not just any ROM. It's not documented anywhere I could find, but through hours of trial and error, I finally found one that worked from the LC Quadra and Performer 630. We'll also need a boot disk and macOS installation media, same as before. Next, we'll need to provision a hard disk image. Like Shapeshifter, Basilisk can use a native partition on the host machine. In the case of my RetroPie, the whole SD card has already been allocated, so I'm going to use a hard file instead. For that, I'll fire up CiderPress and create a 200 megabyte HFS image. Each block is 512 bytes, so 200 megs times 1024K bytes times two blocks gives us our total here. With that done, I'll FTP everything over to the Raspberry Pi. You could also use the USB thumb drive method, as the act of installing Basilisk will automatically create the Macintosh directories for you. You'll also want to rename the ROM file to Mac.ROM, since the emulator is configured to look for that by default.
Back on the Pi, it's time to configure the emulator, but there's no UI available for this, so we'll hit F4 to drop to a shell. The emulators.cfg file defines the initial ROM and disk image paths that are passed to Basilisk upon launch. This is a sane set of defaults, but does limit the user to a single drive. As we're going to be mounting up a lot of different disks, I'm going to get rid of this default. Note the EXTFS option, which makes our Pi's host disk available to the Mac with zero effort on our part. The real meat of our configuration is in the basilisk2.cfg. It's much nicer to have our disk statements here, as it's a multi-line file, so I'll define our boot and installation media, as well as our blank hard disk image here. Since this is a fast machine with chunky graphics, we don't need to skip the rendering of any frames to lower the CPU utilization like we did on the Amiga. I'll also bump the CPU to an 040 and enable the floating point unit. I have to believe that many of the defaults in this file are intended for very old systems and don't take full advantage of our Pi's hardware. Now we're ready to start our Mac for the first time. I want to point out that this is the actual speed. I'm not fast forwarding the video here. Wow, okay, that was quick. All three of our disks show up, so I'll run the Mac OS installer and accept the default options. Again, no camera tricks here. The install is running at normal speed. Remember that this step took over 15 minutes on the Amiga 3000 with its 030 CPU. And done. Not too shabby. This bodes well for what's to come next. With the boot and install images no longer needed, I'll remove them from the config and also bump up the RAM to 32 megabytes because why not? And here's our system booting from the hard disk image we just built. I've already taken the liberty of installing Stuff It Expander from a disk image so I can decompress some software. And getting that software to our new Mac is a breeze with the host's file system showing right up as a Unix disk. I can simply FTP files to the Pi and they show up here, ready to be copied into our Mac. Since we're going to want to benchmark this thing, I'll copy speedometer over and decompress it. I suspect the emulator is doing something to restore the resource forks of the files on the Unix drive because the Mac recognizes their type automatically.
As before, I'll run all of the tests so we can see how our emulated Mac performs. Once again, this footage has not been sped up or altered. Finished. I've copied over the results from the Amiga 3000 so we can compare side by side. The 3000 tested favorably with the Macintosh 2 Ci, also powered by an O30 CPU with floating point unit. As you've probably already guessed, this was never a fair fight. The Amiga results only register as a tiny blip, overshadowed by the math performance of our Pi 400. It's a good thing we turned on the FPU, huh? When we tested color on Shapeshifter, it had to translate between the Mac's chunky graphics and the Amiga's bit planes. No such issues here. 24-bit color displays beautifully and the UI stays snappy and responsive. Heck, we can even play QuickTime videos on this thing, albeit at 12 frames per second. Things get a little choppy when we try to scale the video to work with our modern resolution display though. I mentioned earlier that Basilisk supports networking. It does, but it's not something that works right out of the box. For our Linux system, we'll need to build and configure SheepNet, a kernel module and device that bridges the emulator to a physical Ethernet card on the host machine. It's included in the source code, so we just need to pull it down and compile it. That done, we'll need to load the module and, this is important, change the permissions of the device so the user running the emulator has access to it. Now, back in our configuration file, we need to add an option telling Basilisk which network device to use. In this case, the Pi's Wi-Fi interface. With the emulator all set up, go into the Mac's control panel and find Mac TCP. The UI here is a bit clunky, but you'll figure it out. You'll need to set up a separate IP address from the host machine, but in the same subnet for this to work. With that done, it's time to fire up our browser. You remember Netscape, right? Man, I missed that cool animation when pages were loading. Get used to watching it though, as load times are just short of glacial on this thing. Modern websites often have hundreds of objects to fetch in order to render the landing page, often weighing in at many megabytes in size, so it's not really the Mac's fault. Time just got away from it. Still, it works with sites that don't require TLS or JavaScript, despite some DNS funkiness and the occasional crash. You could use it to download files straight to your virtual Mac if you don't mind the speed. Anyway, it was a fun experiment. So what else can we do with this thing? Well, one claim to fame classic Max had was their image and video editing capabilities, so why not fire up Photoshop and see how it performs? 
Surprisingly, it was able to import a PSD file from a modern version. I did have to cut the file down several times to get it to open though, because the original was larger than the Mac could fit in memory or in a page file before filling up the virtual disk. This forced me to relive some long suppressed memories of just how resource hungry these applications were back in the day and how unstable they got when there wasn't enough RAM or disk space available. After a bunch of crashes, I did get it working pretty well though. Ooh yeah, lens flare. Who doesn't love one of those? Aw, 32 megs of RAM doesn't love one of those. Typical. As expected, there were no issues playing games requiring color modes, unlike with the Amiga. The biggest issue was that the smaller resolutions used in these games aren't scaled by the emulator, so they appear in small boxes on the screen. Performance was good, and not a single title I tested crashed, locked up, or exhibited any unusual behavior. What do you think? Is this going to work? Let's rock. Damn, those alien bastards are going to pay for shooting up my ride.
Okay, not bad. The mouse had some crazy input lag, so I switched to the keyboard, but I'm not used to playing like this, so pardon the clumsiness. Performance is actually pretty good. The frame rate's a little low, but it's completely playable. Who wants some? And that pretty much sums up my experience with Basilisk 2 on the Raspberry Pi 400. It handled everything I threw at it and surpassed my expectations. For most common tasks, the performance was exceptional. With next generation workloads, it struggled a bit, but the fact that it can do these things at all is pretty amazing. If you're into classic Macs and are looking for an all-in-one solution that's inexpensive, portable, and capable of much more besides, look no further. You didn't think I was going to tease you with a better Mr. Alternative and not show it, did you? So, just as we left it in episode 22, here's the Mini Mig Amiga Core. Only this time, I've loaded up Shapeshifter, just like on my real 3000. The only difference is that I have a Macintosh LC ROM, as this core emulates an O20 CPU. Another big difference is that we have RTG graphics, so I can take advantage of the color modes now. So here's the Mr. FPGA emulating an Amiga, emulating a Macintosh. What a world we live in. Unbelievably, this Frankenstein monster is stable, responsive, and has all the features we love from Shapeshifter. It generally works great, a testament to how mature the underlying Minimig core really is. You can even pass files from the Mr. to the Amiga to the Mac seamlessly through two layers of shared drive support. If you're looking to emulate a classic Mac on your Mr., this is a really solid option. So there you have it, a few more ways to enjoy the classic Macintosh experience when you don't actually own a classic Macintosh. I hope you learned something new, I sure did. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on RetroBits.